with um, great excitement that we welcome Dr. Jennifer Thomas to be with us today from Wisconsin. We made the trip this morning. And Dr. Jennifer Thomas is, um, besides being a practicing pediatrician, also has her master's in public health, is a board certified lactation consultant, is a fellow of the American Academy of Pediatrics, and a fellow of the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine. Dr. Thomas is also the author of um, a new book that's been out about a year, uh, Dr. Jen's Guide to Breastfeeding, Meet Your Breastfeeding Goals by Understanding Your Body and Your Baby. And Dr. Thomas just brings so much wisdom, so much passion, so much knowledge. I feel very privileged to introduce her and to let her speak for herself. Welcome. Not that I would ever say that Wisconsin is lagging behind, because that would never be true. <laughs> and I already took a shot to the collarbone once this morning, so nobody gets stuck about Aaron Rodgers. Got it? <laughs> like seriously? I'm loaded. I'm hurt. I almost can't function. The whole state is paralyzed. I don't know what <laughs> I mean, the economy of Wisconsin really rests on the Packers, and so I had to come to Illinois today to, 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 to just, I have to make fun of the Bears at some point. It's not fun, though. All right. Well, it sounds like you guys are doing a lot of great work, and before I start yapping, I'd love to know what you guys do. So, how many of you guys work in hospitals? So, labor and delivery, mom, baby, okay? All right, uh, how many of you guys work in like a, a pediatric or family practice office? Ooh, good, cool. Do we have any docs in the audience? Score? It's two more than I usually have? Yay. <laughs> tell me, uh, tell me health departments, wait. Okay, did I miss anybody? Midwives, okay. That's my fault. Yes, I'm so excited about the prenatal part of this. So I get to talk all about the stuff I know about, which is, you know, I'm a pediatrician. But the OB part of it is, I think, probably the biggest thing we're missing right now, is into making a continuous journey for moms. We really, I just had spine surgery recently, and I knew from my surgeon you know, I got educated as to what was going to happen. I went to the hospital, it happened afterwards, I knew what was going to happen. And it was a pretty consistent message throughout the whole surgery. And I was thinking to myself, you know, we give moms no message or a weird one. There was a study that was just published a couple of days ago that said that the average first visit to the OB, they spend 60, no, I'm sorry, 39 seconds addressing breastfeeding, and often in an ambivalent ma manner. Now, in the defense of the people who might have been doing the counseling at the first visit, maybe that wasn't the perfect visit to, to be looking at, but this was in the Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and they were talking about the, what happened at the first visit. First visit, 39 seconds we spend uh, in the first prenatal visit talking about, about breastfeeding. And it really, we don't need to start that journey there, do we? We need to start it with little kids. We need to start with a curriculum that says when you're learning about <laughs> mammals that there's a picture of a human there. Yes. You know, come on. It's not that hard. We're mammals. Let's figure it out. You put the horse, you put the dolphin, you put the whatever you want to, and then you put the human, and then you say, isn't that cool? So that we don't have to start with the 39 seconds, oh my gosh, 39 seconds, um, and the first prenatal visit. So um, the other thing that the study noted was that it, it was done ambivalently, and I would guess it was, is that even a word? Did I make that up? Uh, <laughs> I would guess what that means is, are you brushed your bottle feeding? And that is a question that just needs to disappear. Yeah. Just needs to go away. It can't. 
It's not, it's not a, it's not a choice. You guys know this. It's a, how can I address your questions about breastfeeding? How do you plan on feeding the baby? Open-ended questions that allow us to start the educational process way in the beginning. But, as I have a tendency to do, I am not talking about what I was supposed to. <laughs> I don't have any relevant financial relationships. I really wish I would. Um, <laughs> seriously, a great honor. Um, and I do not intend to discuss anything. Um, what would I talk about? Anyway, there it is. So this is where I'm from. I am from the south side of Milwaukee. You can tell because I say Milwaukee. I swallowed two, two syllables there. This is uh, this is the view. Oh, oh down. Where's my Where did it go? There it is. This is the view uh, for from when I used to be able to run before my spine surgery at about the four mile mark from my house, which I love. This is the one straight through the woods from my house, which is pretty cool. This, uh, I hate this tree right here, but I like this picture. This tree right here was the turnaround point for the 400 meter when I was running cross country. <laughs> I hate that tree, but I love, I love it. I love this view. And up in the corner, my brother doesn't want to work. There we go. Um, is St. Joan of Arc Chapel from Marquette University. So, And there's got to be somebody in here from Marquette because everybody I went to school with from Marquette was from some suburb of Chicago. So. There's somebody from Marquette in here, right? Seriously, did I find a room full of people that are really not from Marquette? Okay, I'm going to tell my son that. He's a sophomore there and he didn't believe it can happen. Uh, okay, so we had a nice introduction about who is watching us. Who's watching us? Well, who's watching us? The Centers for Disease Control is watching us. They're doing their maternity practices score. We get our M pink score. Are you guys familiar with that? An M pink score is maternity practices in something, something, blah, 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 acronym. I never understand why people need to talk in acronyms. But what it does is it takes a look at some outcome measures and it, it, it's based on the 10 steps. And hospitals, each hospital, is, it has a designated person that fills out the form and it's anonymous so that hospitals can't compete against one another and you are scored based on your responses and then you get a, a M pink score. The scores out of 100 we are averaging as a nation 65. See, I never saw 65 in any of my papers. What does that mean? <laughs> is it good? Because we were sort of celebrating that the numbers were headed up toward 70 in Wisconsin. I'm like, that's still a C minus, right? I don't get C minuses, so we're going to have to work hard. And one of the things that was the biggest problem nationwide was coming out of the hospital. What were the obstacles that moms were facing? So. The tenth step of the ten steps nationally is the is the biggest problem. Where do we send mom when she leaves the hospital? What support system does she have? What things are in the community? And then really getting people who are in the community who are providing this this army of people who wants to help breastfeeding moms, getting them connected with the people who see the moms a couple days after delivery. They should be seeing the babies a couple days after delivery. If the pediatricians and family practitioners in your area are not seeing the babies three to five days at post-discharge, that is not standard of care. That hasn't been standard of care for years. They are only opening themselves up to big, big problems. And, and we are motivated unfortunately by lawsuits and that's one there are too 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 many organizations saying now that babies have to be followed up within the next couple of days after they're discharged from the hospital we already heard that the joint commission uh, is watching did you all get a little tingle on your back <laughs> quick hide the cleaners <laughs> um race race i don't know uh let's see 
Rescue? I don't know. I don't know. It's on my badge. I'm nervous. Go away. But I'm glad they're watching because they do make people nervous. We have the Surgeon General talking about rescuing with a nice 19 point guide for us to follow. Or more than that. Maybe I stopped recording at 19. The White House is watching. The American Academy of Family Physicians and the American Academy of Pediatrics is watching. Now, I am among the leadership of the section on breastfeeding for the AAP nationally, and so I really know what we're watching. I was uh, in the room when the policy statements that we have on breastfeeding were coming out. So, What all this adds up to is standard of care. Two to three days post-discharge, we're supposed to see the baby. All of these people are watching. Breastfeeding support is now standard of care. And when we start taking a look at best practices, standard of care means something to people. So what does the AAP say? And I want to tell you about this. We have committees, council sections, all sorts of stuff within the American Center of Pediatrics, and there's a hierarchy. So the section on breastfeeding rates lower than the committee on nutrition. Committees are more important than sections, but the, the Committee on Nutrition has been saying for the longest time that there's no data to support uh, six months of exclusive breastfeeding. And so they have been saying four to six months, we've been saying six months, and the AAP said, before your policy statement can come out, we're going to lock you guys in the room, and you are going to come to some kind of consensus. It reminds me of like a Snickers commercial, you know, like going nowhere for a really long time, because they were going to sit in that room, and we were going to discuss this until a consensus was reached, and we did. And we, we got it. So this is... When we see AAP policy, it is not AAP policy from the section on breastfeeding. This is AAP policy from the AAP. So this is breastfeeding for all infants as indicated. Breastfeeding from birth to, we had to concede to the uh, preposition about, to about six months. Breastfeeding plus complementary feedings from six to 12 months and then continue for as long as you want to after 12 months. So that is what the American Academy of Pediatrics has said, and this is not the section, this is the whole AAP. So I thought I would put together how the state of Illinois is doing on its exclusive breastfeeding rights, and I didn't use a kid's graph maker online to do this. Well, I did, and it's cool, because you get to pick all sorts of really cool colors that you want to do otherwise, and I thought, wow, this is fun. So we want, <laughs> you remember those nice goals that they set up for us for breastfeeding to, for 2010? You know, we want 75% initiation, and then 50% going to six months, and then 25% continuing through one year. Who do you need? You're like 81.9 percent need to ever breastfeed. Come on, I gotta go talk to lots of people. I don't remember stuff like this. We could just say 82 percent. No, no, we're gonna say 81.9 percent. So Illinois is doing pretty well, 76.8 percent. They're now looking at three months of exclusive breastfeeding, and they want that at 46.2 percent. Illinois is getting there. You guys have some work to do. Um, more work to do than we do. Um, and for exclusive breastfeeding, we all stink. This really, you know, to put a goal at 25.5% of exclusive breastfeeding is, is really difficult. And one of the reasons is this. This is a sad slide. This is a sad slide. I share this slide and then I want to cry. So this right here, this blue line right there is the only one that I want to talk to you guys about. And what that is in the key, I think that's what this says, it says before two days. So we want 25 point something percent of women to make it to exclusively breastfeed, right? But that line says 20% plus, and the line is going up of babies born in U.S. hospitals are being supplemented in, I'm sorry, what did I say? The first two days? 
The first two days, that means that one out of every five of the kids born to our species cannot make it two days without having some kind of intervention other than their mother's own milk. We, ladies and gentlemen, are a sad species, if that is true. We do not have resiliency. We do not have things put in place to help our kids survive infancy. This is no good. We have to, we're focusing on exclusive breastfeeding at six months and we want 25% of those mothers to make it. Well, we can't get them out of the hospital without supplementing them. We have a problem there. We have a bit of a disconnect between, you know, national priorities and what is actually going on in the hospital. I, I keep <laughs> All right. So what I want to talk about is the science behind exclusive breastfeeding, and I, I do this because I want to share some of my passion with you. I have a degree in English literature. <laughs> So whenever we start talking about the immune system, I have to, I have to sort of put it in an like a put it in an English major way, okay? But if this is if this is still confusing, despite the fact that an English major put this together, I need you to stop me, okay? So that we can understand this. This is a this is a nice sized room, so I you can tell I'm highly unapproachable. And um, I want dead silence during the course of my presentation. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I want you to understand this. So I've got lots of slides. I can talk all day if you wanted me to. But what's important to me is that you guys leave here with something that's absolutely immediately useful for you. You don't understand this. This is not immediately useful. So we want to see the role of exclusive breastfeeding in the developing immune system. So this is a formula and breast milk underneath the slide. And so <laughs> it's funny. So I, I thought I got the permission I needed to from the owner of the slide. And then I was in Idaho and I was I showed this slide and the lady came up to me at the break and she said, you know, that's my milk. And I'm like, what? <laughs> But I got the slide, and she's like, no, that's mine. <laughs> I was like, okay, can I use your slide? She's like, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, so which side is the breast milk? Right or left? Right. Right. You have to say it with conviction. Right. right. Thank you. All right. <laughs> is it right? Is it left? There are so many. See, this is you got to. This is see. This is what brings down the steel traps and cobwebs in my brain because this is all macrophages and all sorts of really cool histologic findings. You've got fat cells and you've got all sorts of immune fighting cells on this side of the of the of the slide. And really, here what we have is nutritional components. And when we get mired in discussing nutrition about breast milk. Right? This is way to casein ratio is the same, or blah, 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 blah. We are starting then to get into the muck. Mm -hmm. We are starting to go down to the level of the nutrition, which is where they want us to be. Breastfeeding is so much more than nutrition. It is infection fighting cells, it is immune system development. It is brain development, it is temperature regulation, and when we start mucking around with the ingredient, we lose. So when we start talking about any new ingredient that's added to a formula, we just got to whatever. Because it doesn't, it provides nutrition by the way. Because what it does for the baby is so much more than that. So what if the breast really was meant to be an immune system gland? In embryology, skin glands with protection, protective inf infection fighting effects are very common. The mammary gland evolved from a mucus secreting skin gland, which would then help protect the skin of the newborn, even if the newborn was an egg. And what I'm going to show you here is the development of the mammary gland over time. So first it starts off as a mucus surface epithelial cell and it secretes and I have to learn these words this is xanthine oxoreductase and lysozyme both of them are powerful 
uh, infection fighting com component. Incredibly powerful infection fighting component. So now we see over time that the mammary gland burrows into the, into the skin and now we have a mucus secreting skin gland, not a surface epithelial cell, but a skin gland. And we still have the xanthine oxoreductase and the lysozyme being secreted by that skin gland. And then pretty soon, we have the development of a glandular system that I think you probably recognize, which is the lactating mammary gland. And we have our same xanthine oxoreductase and lysozyme. But what you're going to see here is that xanthine oxoreductase it goes on to help in the creation of uh, fat droplets, and lysozyme is crucial for the production of lactose and alpha-lactalbumin. All of those things, the fat droplets, the lactose, and the alpha-lactalbumin are nutritional components in breast milk. But the first thing that happened was the development of the infection-fighting cells within the breast. Mm -hmm. So the newborn gut is sterile. How do we colonize? How do we colonize the the baby? How's the baby get the good bacteria? The baby needs good bacteria. Where's the baby gonna get good bacteria? See now this is a story for me. I had my first son 20 years ago. I was an intern and I knew enough about it and my OB rotation, everything was okay. And the only thing I didn't realize is that I might poop while I was on the table. It was bad enough that my med school classmates were going to be delivering my son and that I was going to be a naked screaming idiot in front of them. But the whole like pooping on the table thing was just not, like I was not okay with that. Like, I'm sorry, this is just not going to happen. But it's no accident that the baby comes out near the anus and that there's fecal material present at the time of delivery. So mom poops, there's a strictly anaerobic harmless bacteria that ends up coming around the, the anal area. Baby gets born vaginally and the gut is colonized in that way. So I'm gonna talk about poop constantly. And here is another role for the importance of the gut. But babies born vaginally are going to wind up getting good bacteria from their mom's fecal material. And I, I have given this talk I gave it to a, a group of perinatologists, and they're like, Jenny, I totally get this, but what do you, what do you want me to do? Like, take the baby and go. <laughs> if they have a C-section, you know? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> So you gotta get the poop somehow. But you remember, <laughs> if you've been around long enough, we used to put baby dye in, we used to shave, we used to try to make that area sterile so that the baby could come out into the world with this perfectly sterile environment when we needed to poop. <laughs> Unbelievable. Okay. <coughs> Things you didn't know. One of my favorite TV shows is Scrubs. Does anybody ever watch Scrubs? They did a fantastic, um, episode and now you have to you have to go to YouTube and see everything comes down to poo because it's the song we sing when we talk about this stuff. Alright, so the baby gets commensal bacteria and those commensal bacteria are critical for immune system development. And what this is, is here's a baby's brand new intestine. And I don't like my pointer, right there. This is the baby's brand new intestinal villi and these are good bacteria. Right here, see these guys, these peanut guys are good bacteria. You see how these things are lined up right there? It looks like they're taking their marching orders from the peanut dudes there, <laughs> and they are. So what's happening is that this bacterium is interacting with the villus of the small intestine, and it is shaping the architecture of the small intestine. So the newborn gut needs to be colonized shortly after birth, and now we figured out how that's gonna happen, and then we have bacteria in the gut. The bacteria in your gut is supposed to be responded to. It's not supposed to be able to live there and live happily ever after. It's supposed to be kicked out. Your immune system is supposed to say, get out of here, we don't want you. So what's got to happen in that newborn baby's brand new gut is that that bacteria has got to be allowed to stay. 
There has to be the, de the development of what's called immunologic tolerance, which means self versus non-self. I'm going to attack this, and I'm going to not attack that. <coughs> This bacterial epithelial crosstalk starts that process and it organizes the spatial relationships between B and T cells of the immune system and cells of the gut-associated lymphoid tissue. But what's got to happen with this immune response to the bacteria, what's absolutely crucial when we get these bacteria into the gut is that there's no inflammation that takes place. So you have to have an immune response to the new bacteria, it's got to help develop the immune system and it can't lead to inflammation. So our normal innate immune system function, and when I do this, when I talk about the innate immune system, the innate immune system is a thing that's everywhere. Like it's everywhere. So it does it's just doesn't it doesn't have to have a very specific thing. It's the it meets and greets, says hello to the bacteria and then calls the guys in that really need to clean up the job. Now when I present this in Wisconsin, I usually have a picture of Clay Matthews there. <laughs> the broken thumb. <coughs> Without his broken thumb? Anyway. And then I find that Clay might be a little too distracting during this time. So. <laughs> but he's everywhere. So he's our innate immune system. And it's important for the defense against infection because they engulf and kill microbes, but the price we pay for letting the Matthews run amok is inflammation and tissue damage. So how does the newborn gut stay away from potentially dam the damage caused by the phagocytes and the rest of the immune system? This is, um, this is a slide that shows you um, a leaky gut in a normal newborn. And I just want to just make a little point here. Um, breastfeeding is normal, right? Did you know that? Because you can fall asleep after this, because breastfeeding is normal. That's my take-home message. It's normal. It's not magic. It's not a step up. It doesn't, you know, turn you into an IV leaguer. It just is normal. It's what's supposed to happen. I have a friend who's a nephrologist who, uh, who when he knows when I'm going to go speak, he's like, are you going to talk about physiology again? And I'm like, yes, because he was mad that he found out that I got to go to different places and talk about how the body normally works. And he said, that would be like me walking around talking about kidneys and asking people not to use their shiny dialysis machine before they need to. You know, and I'm like, well, I suppose we have gotten to a point now where I have to go back and tell everybody how physiology works. And this is, this is physiology. So if the newborn gut is normal, if the breastfeeding gut is, is normal, you see that in the first 10 days, that black bar, there, Right there, turn the back to the camera, that's not nice. Um, we, right here, the black bar shows that the exclusively breastfed infant doesn't have a very leaky gut at the 28 days of age. And at 50 days of age, you're still, the baby is, is, the breastfed baby is, still has not a very permeable gut compared to those that are formula fed. But in this first 10 days, the newborn gut of a breastfed infant is more permeable than a, one of a, of a child who is exclusively formula fed. And because breastfeeding is normal, this leakiness in the first 10 days must be normal. So human milk st stimulates the strictly held balance of immune cells that are crucial for developing an immune system that recognizes what to get rid of and what to keep. what to destroy and what to leave alone. The delay in the immune system allows for less energy and nutrients for the immune system of that infant. And that delay is good because the immune system does need it to work. And when it does, the processes needed increase nutritional energy and demands. That energy can then be used for the growth and development of the central nervous system in the lungs. So what does this mean? We have a leaky gut we have a baby who is going to allow proteins to go back and forth in the first 10 days because that leakiness is planned. There's going to be a delay in the immune system. 
crucial proteins are going to be able to go back and forth. And because there's a delay in the immune system, we're not using as much energy as we're supposed to be using. And that energy can therefore be used for other things like the central nervous system and the lung. And all of this works because human milk. All the defense is given from the human milk, antimicrobial, anti-inflammatory, and immunomodulating agents protect from inflammation. Plus, it just makes sense and it's really efficient that most of the antimicrobial and other defense agents in human milk are used to nurture the baby, not to fight that. Human milk is the it's the starting event, it is the continuing event, it is the thing that we are going to need to get all of the things ready for our immune system to work. So when we think about this, when we think about a, a brand new baby horse, that colt is up running in a couple hours, right? If our babies were born at a time when they could run, God help us all. <laughs> but it's important for a baby horse, or maybe a baby elephant, or a baby zebra to be able to keep up with the rest of the herd, because that's how they survive infancy. Our babies are born when they're incredibly neurologically immature, and they're going to need to survive infancy what are the things that are going to get them? Well, disease. And then predators. So we're going to have to talk about that later. And so our kids ask us to protect them, to, to, help, to help them survive infancy. So they're going to need protection against diseases, which is what we're going to be talking about. And then they're going to need protection against things that might eat them because they don't know that they've been born into a loving family in 2013. And they think that they might be able to be you know, taken in the middle of the night. And actually, a new mom thinks that that baby might be taken in the middle of the night. So I keep that in mind because we're going to talk about that. So the normal intestinal immune system, and this is just a busy slide, but I want to show you this, which you can barely see. Uh, I can barely certainly see this. It's the, it's, it's the isolated lymphoid follicle. And when I was sitting in the, in the seats listening to this lecture from Ellen Walker from Harvard, he was talking about this newly identified particle in breast milk, and it was called this isolated lymphoid follicle. And it comes from plastron, and there are a bunch of things that are sitting in the newborn gut that are just waiting for colostrum to come and activate them. And I'm sitting, and I'm like, of course, of course, there are structures in the newborn gut that are waiting to be activated by colostrum. And so one of the things that we can tangibly talk about is this isolated lymphoid follicle. And what it does, it goes through the lymph system, the cardiovascular system, and then actually stimulates the growth of B and T cells, which are crucial for the development of the immune system. No colostrum, none of this starts. And if you can ignore the pneumothorax on this um, chest x-ray, what we have here is um, a sale sign for the uh, uh, the thymus. So we talk about taking pictures of newborns and their thymus getting in the way and trying to tell whether or not it is a pneumothorax or if it is a pneumonia or whatever it is. And this is a this is a sale sign. So what happens is there are things that are present in classroom that help with T and B cell development. Um, we have delayed T cell function because we everything's delayed in the first couple of days for the newborn gut. But breastfed infants can have a thymus twice, probably up to four times the size of a, 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 a thymus of a formula-fed infant. So what happens is that there are new properties of human milk that are priming resting thymus cells. And then those uh, T cells that have been signaled by human milk develop in the gut-associated lymphoid tissue, and then they're sent on to the thymus to continue to develop. That, to me, is amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's a really super cool system that you just birth the baby and then you watch baby, the baby latches, 
and their immune system starts to go into overdrive, which I think is fantastic, but do we know that? I mean, do we know that when we talk about skin-to-skin -skin contact and the early hours and that golden hour and those first things, the first milk that's transferred, do we actually know what's happening? I want you to know so that you can spread the word. Part of this is the development of the gut-associated lymphoid tissue, the immune system, B cells, T cells, things that are going to keep that baby free from infection. And why is that important? Well, I don't know if you can see, I circled a little, because this is a really busy slide. See the little red dot? So in terms of immunoglobulins, so things that are specific to fighting infection, like immunoglobulin A, that is a sticky immunoglobulin. It lines the surfaces of the respiratory tract and, and stops invaders from coming in. Um, if you trace that line back down to where the red circle is, there is no immunoglobulin A in the newborn. If we trace out the immunoglobulin E, which is responsible for fighting off parasites, but is mostly um, associated with allergic diseases, we got a big old Zippo right there, nothing. And then if you take a look at IgM, which is the first responder to an infection, the baby doesn't have any of that either. The only thing the baby has is transplacentally acquired immunoglobulin G, and that doesn't last for very long. So we have a baby who comes into the world essentially completely unprotected from infection. Completely unprotected from infection. So one of the things that we can do to help our kids survive agency and fight disease is use this amazing mechanism, which is secretory IgA. So we have in this mom's gut, there is, a, there is a cell that is monitoring for bad guys. And that cell, if it sees an invader, will go through a pathway that leads to right outside the lactocyte. And it will deliver the message of that particular infection. And what happens is that there's all sorts of information that is sent through the lactocyte and then this secretory IgA winds up in the breast milk. Now the secretory addition to the IgA helps it um, survive gastric digestion. So one of the things my colleagues have said is that there's no way that an immunoglobulin is going to get past gastric pH. First of all, the gastric pH of the stomach of a newborn is like five. That's not acid. It's going to live. The other thing is, is that we have this the secretory part of the IgA to help it get into the baby's immune system. So mom makes stuff that the, she and the baby are exposed to. The baby gets secretory IgA, and the baby is protected from whatever mom was exposed to. So let me <laughs> let me ask you this. We have mom who has got these great cells that are monitoring for bad guys, right? And the baby is going to benefit from that because the baby's going to get secretory IgA to whoever it is coming to bother. So, housekeeping, dinner, food service, oh, who's here? Oh, it's a cute new baby, yay! Interruption after interruption after interruption after interruption. The, one of the studies I read said that average mom was interrupted 70 times during the course of her hospital stay in like a 24-hour period. You know how many people she's exposed to? All right, so now she can make secretory IgA against all the people that come into her room, but what if we stick the baby in the nursery, right? Where is the baby going to get exposed to? A whole different set of people. An entirely different set of people. And you know who most of those people are? Us. Right? Healthcare professionals. And what kinds of fun things do we carry? <laughs> right. Bad things. So I have suggested to the parents in my practice that if they want to send the baby to the nursery, for whatever reason, you usually talk them out of it, that I want them to then subsequently go back to the nursery and lick everybody who is taking care of them. <laughs> I don't see why that's unreasonable. I think that they should do that for holiday gatherings. I think, I think if there's going to be a million people coming in, I think that 
the breastfeeding mom should be able to say, come here, I need to get a little bit of sample from you. <laughs> and I used to say kiss, but that's socially acceptable. <laughs> Licking is not socially acceptable. It implants something in that mother's mind where she's like, yeah, I'm going to be doing that. And makes you think maybe a couple of times about it saying, you know, the baby really can go to the nursery. It's empowering to be able to say, I would like that procedure done in my room. I want to be able to be exposed to you. I want you to be able, I want to be able to protect my baby from whomever the baby is exposed to. So if we needed another reason to room in, here's another reason to room in. Another way to pre prevent inflammation in that baby's gut, because that's all we're doing. We're starting the immune system, and to start the immune system, we have to we have to uh, we have to prevent inflammation. One of them is uh, prebiotics, not probiotics, but prebiotics. And these guys are, I'm going to talk about them because they, it's, they have to do with poop. So I have a problem with poop. I'm married to a psychiatrist, so it's helpful. Um, <laughs> prebiotics are non digestible food components that unofficially affect the gut by providing food for good bacteria that hopefully already inhabit it. In human milk, the most common prebiotics are oligosaccharides, which are the third most common component of mature milk. Non pathogenic bacteria, the good ones that came in at birth, can bind to the cell surface because they contain the right receptors to let them bind. They have an invitation to the dance. Pathologic bacteria are inhibited from attaching either because the prebiotic has plugged the part of the bacteria that helps it attach or blacks the receptor site. This is needed to prevent inflammation. It is one of the reasons that there is such an abundance of oligosaccharides in human milk. And as an abundant, non-digestible component of human milk, oligosaccharides help with frequent stooling, preventing constipation, and aiding in their removal of belly rubin. So oligosaccharides make you poop. And that's going to be a very important thing because we fill moms up with so much IV fluid that they are water balloons. Yeah. Their babies are water balloons. And there are too many good studies now to show that the babies are losing, on average, somewhere around 10% of their birth weight by day five. <coughs> and where are they day five? Oh, yeah. They're in the outpatient practice. So when they lose as much as 10% of their body weight, the first thing to do is go, ah, which is what everybody seems to do. That's not it, okay? The answer is to say, how much IV fluid did you get, <clears throat> especially in the hour before delivery? How, what was the rate of the decline of the weight loss? Did it happen like 8% in the first 36 hours and the baby is only down a little bit now? And how is the baby pooping? Right? Because if the baby is stooling frequently, and we don't have to worry about the, the weight loss nearly as much as if the baby is not pooping. All right? Because if the baby's pooping, the baby's transferring these oligosaccharides. The baby's transferring milk. It's the, it's the best indicator for us to try to wade through all of the hospital interventions that were done and try to figure out if a baby is doing well. So we want the babies to have clear the meconium after about four or five days. Um, and if they haven't cleared the meconium by day four or five, then we have a problem. We, have, we definitely have a problem. If they're not stooling in the hospital, we have a problem. But it's more important to take a look at the stool output than it is to reach for the urine output. I actually had one of the nurses tell me um, that one of my patients peed out of his diaper. Like, he had a newborn, put a newborn, like, diaper on, and was able to fill it to the point where um, it overflowed. Now, is that normal? No. And then the moms, they get used to these super heavy diapers. And by the time that they get to the three to five day visit, they're saying, I don't know if the baby's peeing anymore. Because they got used to those super heavy diapers in the, in the nursery. So, mm -hmm. stool up. Stool up was very all right, so here's a little cartoon about how prebiotics work. This is how bacteria usually gets on there. So this is, the, this is a good bacteria. There is a receptor and there is a site for the receptor to bind. If we don't like the bacteria, the prebiotic, usually an oligosaccharide, gets in there and um, binds the, uh, 
this site or it binds the receptor site here. So it looks like spaceships, but this way, this bacterium never hits the cell surface and the body doesn't have to respond in an inflammatory way. So probiotics, which are the good bacteria, need an invitation to the environment that hosts them. Prebiotics, oligosaccharides, suppress the immune reaction to the probiotic while participating in host defense against pathogenic bacteria. And that allows nature to permit a host defense without the need of an inflammatory response. But are good bacteria and prebiotics all that's necessary? Well, of course not. Oligosaccharides are necessary but not sufficient to properly colonize the infant's intestine. We need something called a toll-like receptor. And I realize we are really getting down to the nitty gritty here. But the toll-like receptors are necessary to bind bacteria in concert with oligosaccharides. And we need these toll-like receptors to help with the development of the immune system. But they are only present in the first five days of life. And tell me again, when are we supplementing 20 to 25% of our kids? Upward down regulation of transcription of genes controlled by human milk on an hour by hour basis. So any alteration in human milk or addition of formula interferes with toll like receptor regulation. It interferes with the development of that baby's immune system. So any amount of formula feeding, just one bottle, leads to colonization with bacteria that produces an inflammatory response. And all of the things that are pro-inflammatory in breast milk that were suppressed because they were not needed are now unleashed and we can have more of an inflammatory response because of the introduction of formula to that baby. Yes? Could you look at the slide? What do you mean by any alteration in human milk? Any you might alteration get a fortifier in or right. Yes. Okay. All right. So we're going to talk about skin disease. The normal newborn asks us to protect them from diseases and then to protect them from predators. And I talk a lot about tigers, right? So neonatal brain development involves the creation of synapses and pruning of non-used neurons. So you know a baby in the womb has got webbed hands and feet. It's got like, what, 12 nipples? They have a tail. And good Lord willing, when they're born, all of that has worked itself out, right? <laughs> So we create, as humans, way too much stuff, and then we get rid of what we're not using. So the baby has as many brain cells as they were going to have at 28 weeks of gestation, and they are going to start hooking up brain pathways um, immediately after birth, and those brain pathways are going to be dependent on the experiences of the newborn. So this is me with my son, my middle son. I don't actually remember this picture being taken. And I think that that is an important reminder for all of us who work in the hospital is that we can educate as much as we want to, but people, even, even sort of smart people like me, uh, yeah, can't remember pictures of themselves being taken. So a lot of the teaching would be nice if somebody else was around to hear. So anyway. It is important to hold your baby. If I'm allowed to write a book, it'll be called second book. It'll be called, Oh My God, Pick Them Up. All right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we need to have critical levels of tactile input for normal brain maturation. Okay. You know what that means? You have to touch the baby. You have to hold the baby. You have to talk to the baby. You've got to do all sorts of things because all of those wonderful experiences are going to create brain synapses. So in my neck of the woods, the hospitals say never put lotion on a baby's skin. Even though it's really dry, don't use lotion. Whenever you say never or always, I am so ready to, to pick apart your argument. I'm like, bring it down and take a softball. Come on, right down the middle. Okay. So, it's, it's, so what? The baby's skin is flaking off. We don't have a dermabrasion kind of thing for little kids to get their skin to come off. 
But if a parent wants to use a lotion, it is a gentle massage. It is gentle touch. It is, it is something that allows the baby to know that their experiences in the world are going to be good. So the skin may not look any better, but the kid's happy. And the kid has been hooking up brain cells during that massage saying, you know what, that was pretty cool, thanks. <laughs> So quality sensory stimulation makes the brain able to think and regulate. And negative experiences, and look at how this is defined. Both the absence of good, the absence of good, the absence of picking up. You know, because somebody said you're spoiling the baby. Um, have long lasting effects. So you know when you go and you see a baby, right? You pick up the baby and the baby stops crying and then you put the baby down and the baby starts crying, and then you pick the baby up and the baby stops crying, right? You see that happen? And then somebody says, oh, look at the baby spoiled already, okay? Right here, right here, this is Target. Right here, Target. It's got everything you need. It's got stuff you didn't even need, knew you needed. It has got everything on your shopping list. You put the kid down, it's Home Depot, all right? It is not. You pick them up, you bring them back to Target, okay? And it's just, I would scream and holler if somebody made me go to Home Depot. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm not kidding. It's just, but it's just Target, it's got everything that you need. Home Depot, Target, you pick. <laughs> so I'm gonna stand in my soap boxes if I haven't been doing that already. A baby at the breast is getting their immune system developed, activating their thymus, staying warm, feeling safe from predators. And you know what predators? They hunt at night. So when people say they have their days and nights mixed up, they, baby, doesn't, baby doesn't have days and nights mixed up. Baby just wants to survive. So a baby's going to survive, baby's up at night looking for the predators. You can say, sweetheart, it's 2013 and we're here and we love you and nobody is going to bug you. The kid's like, whatever, I'm going to Target. <laughs> <laughs> they are wiring their brain and oh, by the way, they are getting some food in the process. When we start getting into debates about the nutritional content of human milk, we are ignoring the many other crucial roles of our species specific, physiologically normal means of nurturing our infants. Those that are suggesting a replacement or an intervention for normal physiology have the burden of responsibility that it does no harm. What do women want? Isn't this been the secret of, somebody wrote a paper on this and I thought, is this, is this, are we breaking some kind of code? <laughs> so what do women want about breastfeeding? They want to know what to expect. So we should tell them what to expect prenatally. Not in the hospital. It's not a good time to learn about this in the hospital. We, they want practical help with positioning the baby to breastfeed that doesn't involve one, two, three, <coughs> onto the breast. Okay? They want effective advice and suggestions. They want acknowledgments of their experiences and feelings. They want reassurance and encouragement. Don't we want everything on this list? Okay, so let's say you're a hat maker, right? You're all hat makers. We do a survey and 80% of the people surveyed want red hats. What color do we make the hats? <coughs> what is the breastfeeding initiation rate in the US right now? 80%, 80% of women are asking for help with breastfeeding. 80% of women are asking for red hats. And do you know what they're getting most of the time? Something close. Sometimes not even, even remotely close to what they're asking. If we are gonna be good business managers, we better be providing the red hat. We provide everything that they said that they wanted on that list. What they said to us was that there was little information given in the antenatal period. We need to get something going on the front end of this. Mm -hmm. We need to find OB educators. We need to get IBCLCs into the OB's offices. We need to find some way of impacting the prenatal care because that is where I see the biggest road bump right now. We are working so hard on maternity care practices. 
we're working hard with the pediatricians, and we're working hard in trying to find resources in the community, but nothing is happening on the front end, and we need that to get fixed. The women that were interviewed said that they felt a collective loss of knowledge and experience of breastfeeding. So they lost their tribe. They can't talk to their moms or their sisters or their grandmothers because we have had three generations now that have not um, breastfed. They want a community or network of support. So does your hospital have like a mom and me kind of group? Okay. Do you have it in the evenings for mothers who actually have to go back to work? Okay. They do not want uh, uh, something, they want it straight. They don't want it sugar-coated. And it's important to understand, in, in this study that I'm using here, found that personal experiences really mess up the advice that you give. So it's important to separate your personal and your professional self when it comes to this. It, it, I, I think we do it for lots of different issues. And, and it is important to say, you know, there is a way of supporting breastfeeding without devaluing breastfeeding itself. So you don't have to say, oh, it wasn't that important to begin with. You acknowledge the journey. You acknowledge the effort. You acknowledge everything that that mom did to get to where she was and congratulate her for every step of her journey. But you don't need to say it wasn't that important. So potential barriers to successful breastfeeding are the latch, and I don't think this is a movie, and because I sent this over email, I don't think it's going to work. Um, but this is uh, the nipple, there, an ultrasound. This is milk jutting out, and this right here, and sometimes I can't believe this, all of this is the tongue muscle, all of it is tongue. And then what you can see on the end, into, right here, is that the nipple is not compressed, okay? Right there? So if the baby's latch is good, there is no nipple compression. If the baby comes off of the breast and it looks like a brand new lipstick, we have a problem, okay? One of my biggest pet peeves is somebody who looks at a breastfeeding mom and baby and says, well, it looks good to me. <laughs> and the mom is saying, it hurts, it hurts, it hurts, it hurts, it hurts. Nobody can tell if a latch is good by looking at it externally. So you can say, wow, it looks pretty good, but if she's saying it hurts, it hurts, it hurts, it hurts, that, that's what counts, all right? So I have done, are you guys familiar with the, the concept of biologic nurturing? It's sort of fun. It's a, it's a uh, research done by Suzanne Colson, but I, intuitively this makes sense. So you have the mom back at about 45 degrees and you have lots of pillows to get her comfortable. And this is not what we do usually when we help the mom breastfeed. We get her into bed and we get her comfortable and then we put the baby right here on her, at, at Target. <laughs> and what happens is if the baby was born with their adult sense of hearing, taste, and smell, so what the baby will do is start licking, and then they'll, they'll, they'll put their hands in, and they'll touch, and smell, and lick, and touch, and smell, and lick. The baby can't see very well. The baby is looking and smelling to try to find where the breast is, and there is a powerful secretion coming off of the um, areola from the Montgomery glands that smells just like amniotic fluid. So if you put a baby back, put a mom here, put a baby here, the baby starts inching along, oh, and you have to like tie your hands behind your back because you totally want to help. But that baby goes inching along, inching along, inching along. There is a reflex right at the chin. So when the chin hits the breast, they go, their gape is really big. It's ah, and so their chin's bop, they're on their ah, and they'll plop on over and they'll latch by themselves. And it is so fun to watch because what we traditionally do is have a mom who's in pain sit up, put a bunch of pillows around her, set the baby down, and sort of smoosh the baby onto the breast. And that's just not how it works. And when you have this baby try to self-attach, and try it once, it is so fun when the baby gets there. And the position of the baby is usually like flown over the mom's, to, like it's totally not something we would set up. I've looked at latches in the hospital and been like, 
yeah, I'm not sure I want to put the kid that way, but uh, it's working. So um, we do so much interfering with actual lashes um, that we need to probably get off on that. Nipple pain. Latch, 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 latch. And so if you're working in an outpatient clinic and the mom comes in and she's complaining about nipple pain, it's the latch. It's the latch. It's the latch. The first 50 things on the list are the latch. So somebody in that office needs to know how to assess a latch or know somebody in the community that can assess a latch. So if mom is complaining of pain, she's going to stop breastfeeding. That's what's going to happen. So we need to find out how we can support her as she makes that journey. Now, in the first couple of days, when her breasts are not filled with a lot of milk volume, the baby might be able to latch. But when they come to my office and they have Hollywood boobs and that baby is trying to suck on a basketball, there is just no way that baby is going to latch well. And so in my office, it's sort of fun to be able to teach hand expression or to use a nipple shield or do something because the mom is so full that she can't, get, uh, she can't get the milk out. And so it's important to be able to have somebody that can assess the latch, the problems, at every step of the way. If you don't know how to do it, we can teach you. But if you don't know how to do it until you're taught, we need a list of resources in the community where that mom can be seen very quickly. If you are a resource in the community, you've got to let people like me know you exist, right? So I hear a lot of complaints about pediatricians not knowing that, you know, get, giving referrals to, uh, to whatever program is out there or whatever uh, IBCLC is in private practice or the lactation consultants at the hospital. If I don't know what your hours are, if I don't know that you exist, I can't refer to you. So there's a two-way street here. I want to refer. You have to let me know you exist. Okay? That's fair, right? Okay, so other things. If it's a really bad latch, what can happen is that it can get infected with staph. If it's a really bad latch and the mom's nipples turn into hamburger, um, what will end up happening is that as the nipple heals, it'll it'll have some vasoconstriction along with it and it, you, they have sharp shooting pains up their breast and the breast gets really itchy and that used to be thought to be yeast and we now think it's vasospasm from a really damaged sensitive uh, area of the body um, so stop chewing from yeast Raynaud's phenomenon where the nipple turns it's got to be white then red then blue very unusual, but it's been fun when I pick up case, cases of Renaud's to talk to my adult radiology or rheumatology colleagues. Oh, I did this for one guy, and he was like, this is fascinating. She really does. She's got a positive ANA. He did this big workup on her. And you picked it up from her nipples? And I'm like, I'm not, I'm not sure I picked it up from her, her nipples. I, I did talk to her. <laughs> yeah, I saw her nipples, and I knew she had her nose. It's very funny. Um, you can have pump trauma. A lot of women think that uh, if they crank up the uh, suction as high as it goes, that it will help their milk supply. So you got to turn it up and then knock it down. So we've got to turn it up to where it's uncomfortable and then turn it down a little bit. It's also important if you are hospital-based to understand that the pumps are not designed to remove colostrum. So. Um, it is confidence rotting for that mom if she is supposed to be pumping and you bring in a pump and she gets drops and she's like, look, I have nothing and you just have to, the equipment's not, it's not, it's not supposed to help. It's really not supposed to help with the classroom. So if you don't know how to teach hand expression yet, you need to learn how to teach hand expression because hand expression in addition to pumping will help increase the milk volume tremendously. Tongue tie, very important cause of, um, of, a, of a poor latch. Um, uh, <clears throat> timing for sore nipples is important. So sore nipples in the immediate newborn period, I get sore nipples at nine months of age when everything has been going fine is probably pregnancy, which sort of bums some moms up. <laughs> and then last on my list is yeast, because it just really, 
Yeast is not, it's an opportunistic pathogen in people who have a compromised immune system. And we treat it all the time, like it's an actual pathogen that happens with kids, all, uh, with babies. Um, <coughs> so, um, just to drive home uh, a point that's probably, uh, a, a horse that's probably pleading for mercy now. Um, of 95 mothers with sore nipples evaluated, for positioning and latch behaviors, more appropriate latch and positioning was associated with less pain. Oh my God, that's so weird. <laughs> <laughs> the correction of positioning and latch helped nearly all 94 women who presented with uncomplicated sore nipples within 10 days postpartum. So it's the latch, it's the latch, it's the latch. And that's the tongue tie. So the baby has to be able to elevate their tongue and stick it out. So this baby is going to have restricted elevation, and it's going to, they're, they're not going to be able to stick it out. And the elevation is probably more important than being able to stick it out. So I've heard a lot of times where people say, I, you know, I can't stick my tongue. The baby can stick the tongue outside the lower alveolar ridge. It's not going to create a problem. And it's more the elevation. Now I'll tell you, if this mom has no pain, we have no problem. Okay. A baby's gaining weight, she doesn't have any pain, this does not need to be fixed. So when we have surgery done on kids, we need to have a surgical indication to intervene. So if we just see a tongue tie and we say, this might pre present problems in the future, that's not okay. You have to be able to say, we have a tongue tie in the baby, and mom is, the baby's not gaining weight, mom's got sore nipples, something. You have to have a surgical indication to get this done. It makes you look intelligent, all right? It just does. Because when you go to people like me who do these phrenotomies or to ENTs or to somebody else like that and say, this needs to be done because it needs to be done, that's not okay. It's just not. If we cut off everything that might be a problem in the future, we might not have a lot left. So I was asked to talk a little bit about billing for breastfeeding, and um, this is this is going to be painful. Um, how many of you guys have uh, ever tried to contract with an insurance company to find out if you could be an independent contractor? Oh, it's okay. A couple people have, have made the journey through the donkey ride through hell. Okay, so. <laughs> When we uh, bill for breastfeeding, we have uh, CPT codes, which are current procedural terminology. The procedure we do is evaluation and management. And we have to describe in our notes the service provided, including the attendee, and then each code has a dollar value that can vary. This is just mind boggling. If this is how I'm paid, okay? So each visit, each code has a specific monetary value, and, and each organization can sort of, not really, but sort of pick what that conversion factor is going to be. But you have to document in order to get paid. Hopefully all of you guys know that documentation is important. It's different than the ICD-9 codes, which are the International Classification of Diseases, and we're getting very close to the implementation of ICD-10. And it justifies the procedure, it's the reason for the encounter, it tells the severity of the illness and the medical necessity of services provided. So each one of the bills that goes out has an ICD-9 code and then it has a CPT code on that supports the ICD-9 code. So there are common codes for breastfeeding, uh, for billing. I don't know how to make this exciting. The American Academy of Pediatrics has a billing guide that you can download for free with all the codes that are used that are very helpful when you are trying to help a breastfeeding mom. But the way that this works, like let's say you want to be an IBCLC and work in a pediatric practice and actually bill. The way that this works is you bill for time. And you have to remember that you might have two patients. So if a mom comes in for sore nipples due to a tongue tie, then you have two patients, two documentations to write up, two co-pays to collect, two bills to, to submit, because you have two patients that should be taken care of. 
And pediatricians are very reluctant to bill for mothers. Um, and so they'll try to, to slam all of the coding into something for the baby. And if it's for mom, it should be documented for mom. It should be put in her chart. It doesn't make any sense to do anything for the mom that doesn't show up for her other providers to see. So it's important that we realize oftentimes that we're dealing with two patients. So we do mostly education when we do breastfeeding. When I, at least I do, uh, when I when I do billing for breastfeeding, um, I have to document. The doctors have to document, and anybody who is going to bill for time independently has to say that over half of the time was spent in counseling, and then you have to say what you're <coughs> counseling in, and then there's a certain code that goes along with how much time you spent with that family. It is just fascinating to sit through building and coding um, seminars. It is. It's mind-boggling, and it, it, it just is very good. Seriously, you can't come up with something easier. I mean, I can go to Target, I can look at a pair of shoes, it's $12.99, I go up there and it'd be $12.99 plus tax. I get it, but this system is just bonkers. So, um, and it's not gonna get any better. So the, the thing that I wanna emphasize is that you can bill for the time that you spend, you can bill for the mom even if you are a pediatrician. So if they start talking to you about, you know, what benefit is it to me um, to, to be doing these breastfeeding consults or to be supporting breastfeeding, you have two patients you can bill for in one visit. Um, consultation codes actually pay much better than regular E&M codes. Again, we have to document, but a consultation, and this would be nice for anybody who requests a consultation from somebody, put it in your notes or write it down because if it isn't really written, then we can't bill for a consultation. So if somebody wants to come to see me, which isn't that far a drive actually because I drove here today, so um, this morning at 5.30 a.m. Um, but if you referred somebody to me, I would need a written report and then I would send a written report back to you because that's what's required. So if you are a nurse or a lactation consultant and you work in a private practice, you are not covered by these codes and you should just, you know, thank your banker right now that you're not. Um, there is one exception, which is a code that's called 99211, which is a brief nurse visit. But you can't get reimbursed for the work that you do with breastfeeding moms if you do it as a joint consult with a physician. And then there are these sort of tempting things that are coming out of the Affordable Care Act where people can apply to become providers through certain insurance networks. Not all networks are recognizing the IBCLC credential as somebody who can fill. Um, and not all networks are requiring an IBCLC credential and are allowing lots of people to build for lactation services. So if you end up having to do this, download our guide and then get somebody, <laughs> every organization you work for has a department filled with people who are experts in billing and coding. They're, they have a hotline for us at my job so that I can, you know, Okay, so I did blah, 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 what do I write down? And they give you the answer. And then they audit my charts and tell me where I was wrong. A lot. Um, but if you ever get to a point where you are going to be billing, the Affordable Care Act and, for example, Aetna is allowing, is allowing uh, independent of a physician you can bill for services. Okay. So here it is, this is the AAP's Guide to Getting Paid. There might be some changes with ICD-10. So we'll rewrite this and uh, um, it'll be a little different, the codes are a little different. I swear, I can now say instead of acute otitis media, I can say acute otitis media with erythema of the left ear. It is ridiculous how, it's sort of fun because I had a kid with this cellulitis on his left cheek and I found a code for it. And I was like, that is wonky. <laughs> but they are that specific on this. All right, so what do we need for a breastfeeding practice? Well, first of all, we need buy-in. 
You have to believe that exclusive breastfeeding is important for the immune system. It is important for brain regulation. It is something to be cherished. It is something to be supported, promoted, protected. It is something that you need to make a priority in your practice. It is a red hat, okay? It's, it's a red hat. So one of the things that you can do is have a mother's room and a waiting room. You can tell mothers that they are more than welcome to breastfeed in your waiting room, but if they don't want to, that you have a room set up for them to go to. We have a room in my in my office building. All it did was, it, 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 I walked to the manager and said, is somebody not using your room? And she said, yes. And so we stuck a sign up on the door that says lactation room. We put some cool stuff in there, just for fun, in case there were siblings. It took like you know, all of 10 minutes to set up. It's, it was arduous. I almost broke a sweat. <laughs> Discourage formula marketing. And I run a breastfeeding medicine practice, and directly across the hall are two OBs who are handing out those formula bags. So my whole department, my hospital, the birthing hospital, and my peds department, we, got, we voted to get rid of the bags. And so the, it's like playing whack-a-mole. You know? <laughs> like you get them out of one place and they just show up at other places and you just want to be like... <laughs> okay. You should track breastfeeding rates in your practice to make sure that you are meeting the needs of the people that you serve. You should use the right growth curves. You should get educated and know where to should get an encouragement and assume that all women are still breastfeeding at each visit. Now this is where personal experience comes in. I give out t-shirts if people make it to a year. Because I see breastfeeding in the United States as like the first scene of Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Seriously, you know? He's in there, he's with that dude that's going to end up dead. And he's walking through and he finally gets to the to the idol, to the baby, and he's, he switches it, and he's got that, like two seconds of, oh, and then the floor crumbles, and there's poison darts, and he's chasing by a big boulder, and then he wakes up with snakes. Why does it have to be snakes? And that is why, so you get your baby for about two minutes before poison darts and boulders and snakes start to show up. And that, so I call it surviving the temple of doom because surviving Raiders of the Lost Ark is stupid. So if we have to survive the temple of doom, any mother in my practice who is giving a drop of breast milk to her baby at a year, we give t-shirts and we recognize them for their journey because I just think it's a cool thing to do. And you know what? I put pictures of this up on Facebook. And I put it up on my website. And uh, what, you know what it is? Those are toddlers that are being breastfed. And you know what the world needs to see? is more toddlers that are continuing to be nursed. Mm -hmm. Because too many people are getting this reaction like, uh, you're still nursing. So eventually they just lie to you. Yeah. What good is that? They're closet nurses. Yes, I'm going to be whole milk, 24 ounces a day, never at night, never in a bottle, never. Because, <laughs> like, when you turn, it, so it's a perfect opportunity. Incentives work because, like, it got to be for a little while, like, the, this thing where everybody was jealous in the playgroup that everybody got a t shirt. And so then everybody else has to get a t shirt. And I've had dads call me and say, You better have a t shirt to sell because my wife's coming. And, and so it was an incentive to keep going and to talk about it and to say, your milk does not turn to water in a year. Poor kid. He's laying in bed on his 365th day of life. And the next day, everything goes to just, it's just done. It's over. Happy birthday, your mom's milk is worthless. <laughs> So I just wanted to put a plug in here. If you guys have not been using the WHO curves in your practice, you ought to be doing that. There is a huge difference. I am loving it in my practice because instead of my breastfeeding kids falling off the growth curve at about six months, which is what you see. Well, this is the CDC overlay with the World Health Organization growth curve. And this is just basically to tell you that there's, wow, a very big difference 
And what happens on the CDC curve is that the breastfed kids peak at about two months of age in terms of their, of their weight and then just fall off towards a year. And I think a lot of people who follow growth curves will see that. So they'll see this big, um, chunky two-month-old who just falls off many, many percentiles um, as time goes on. With the WHO curves, that doesn't happen. So the CDC curve was a sample of all the kids in the United States, regardless of how they were with, from fed. The WHO curves, and people refer to them as the breastfeeding curves, and that's got to stop because breastfeeding is normal. So these are normative curves, right? So they went in to, uh, uh, to about six or seven different countries, and it was uh, it, the babies were exclusively breastfed, had access to um, plenty of food, and were in a non-smoking environment. And so they created a growth standard, which is how are the kids supposed to be growing? And we are not seeing those babies fall off at a year, which is um, sort of sad because it cut down on my consults considerably. Because the people were sending me to failure to thrive when it was 10 month old to a failure to thrive. And I would just plot them on the poop curve. I felt bad about charging. I mean, I did, but I felt bad about it. <laughs> So what else would you want to do? You would want to commit to training all office staff and skills necessary to support breastfeeding. I have had meetings with each one of my receptionists, seriously, because they are the ones that can make the offer to let the moms go into the lactation room if they want to. They are the ones that can give the little snickering looks, and they are the ones that um, present my first line. So they were one of the first groups that I hit when we opened up our breastfeeding center. We have to commit to expanding the network of support for breastfeeding by developing and nurturing reciprocal working relationships with local lactation specialists and community organizations. And we need to counsel mothers about ways to overcome negative social pressures related to breastfeeding. When I teach breastfeeding classes, I make mothers raise their hand and promise me that if they are having problems, that they will ask for help, okay? Then the next thing that I ask them to do after their promise is to pull out their smartphone. Maybe I'll have you guys do this at some point today. Pull out your smartphone, go to the app store and download LactMed, okay? L-A-C-T, M-E-D, download it on your phone. It is from the National Library of Medicine. It is an up-to-date resource of all medications and mother's milk. It gives you a summary, real time, on your phone, if medications are compatible with breastfeeding. Seriously cool thing to have. Now there's a real live website if you wanted to use that. But if you want to empower your mothers so that they don't have to pump and discard their milk after a chest x-ray or an MRI or a CT scan or something like that, that is the way to do it. Let them download Blackmed so that they can type in whatever they want to and say, hey, look at this. And by the way, while you're looking, download it on your own phone. So, I love it. I should have done that at the beginning. I do that all the time at the beginning. I say, pull out your phone, right? They can turn them off and turn them off. And say, go to your app store, download it. I'll, I won't be offended if you go ahead and download the app. It's free. So, a breastfeeding friendly office would have an IBCLC in it. How many IBCLCs are in here? Okay, rigorous examination. That test is the hardest I can do of all the tests I have to take again. Now, that demonstrates the ability to provide knowledgeable and comprehensive lactation and breastfeeding. So, I want to talk about a really cool thing that one of my friends did at her. Um, Place of employment in Virginia. Um, are you guys familiar with the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine? Okay. It's an all physician organization. Um, right now, there are to earn fellowship in the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine, you have to prove that you did something useful in breastfeeding um, more than a few times. There's only 88 of us who have the designation of FABM internationally. Um, so. This is a, a, a group of physicians. We uh, mostly do education for other physicians because I don't know if you guys have noticed, but doctors usually only want to talk to doctors. So we have the breastfeeding medicine protocol number 14, and we also have an 818 policy that says 
that pediatricians should serve as breastfeeding advocates and educators and not solely designate this role to staff or non-medical lay volunteers. That's right in the AAP policy statement. We can't just delegate. Pediatricians need to have a knowledge base. Communicating with families that breastfeeding is a medical priority that is enthusiastically recommended by their personal pediatrician will put support for mothers in the early weeks postpartum. So AAP policy says pediatricians need to get on board. I'd be happy to provide you with that reference, but it's the AAP policy statement on breastfeeding and the use of human milk. And all of you guys should probably be able to access that for free. So what my friend did and her friends and her friends, and they call two friends, um, in Virginia is they implemented the ABM protocol number 14. Um, all of the things that it said, have a breastfeeding policy, all of the wonderful things in, in that, in that um, ABM protocol. Um, that's bfmed.org if you want to access the protocol. So this is the rate of exclusive breastfeeding, pre-intervention, and post-intervention. Uh, after uh, the hospital, week one, month two, month four, and month six. And, sh and they showed that just by implementing <coughs> the, the simple steps that were in the ABM policy, that their rates of exclusive breastfeeding were um, post intervention. Post every, every one of these was statistically significant. It's a really cool study. If you need physician education for a very friendly hospital initiative, you can get it at WellStart International. The completion of the WellStart modules can be used to satisfy the requirements of three or more hours of training for physicians by the baby friendly assessment, and it's free. A lot of a lot of hospitals who are choosing to go baby friendly have decided to use the WellStart modules. One of the biggest carrots right now to get pediatricians on board is to provide them what is called maintenance of certification credit. And I don't see anybody like falling over, but it's awful. To re to re-up and sit for your boards again for pediatrics, you have to do a quality improvement project and you have to show that you did a knowledge base assessment in addition to a number of different hoops that you can go through. And so as people are getting ready to resit for their boards, they have to prove that they've done these QI projects or that they have done, uh, well, and they have done these knowledge-based assessments. In Virginia, at breastfeedingconsortium.org, they provide maintenance of certification for the American Board of Pediatrics Part 2 and Part 4. And it's enough to get um, again, the three hours that the physicians need, plus you've got this enormous carrot. I mean, it's a big carrot. It's like a carrot, like, 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 you know, the size of a, the Twinkie in uh, Ghostbusters, uh, in order to get pediatricians on board. The AAP has a number of different books. They don't, um, for, they don't count towards the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative. But some of these things, this checklist for breastfeeding and health supervision um, was mailed out to every single pediatrician in the country who is a member of the AAP. This is a breastfeeding tele <coughs> uh, telephone triage um, for, for any outpatient office clinic. The New Mother's Guide to Breastfeeding in Bulk Rates is something that's nice to give out to your families. Um, and there's a new edition of the Breastfeeding Handbook for Physicians. Um, which is pretty exciting because I have two chapters in it. So. Um, there is also a, a breastfeeding curriculum that everybody has been using. So initially, it was designed to go to 10 different residency programs across the country. Um, we asked uh, for uh, seven to be in the pilot group and seven to be in the intervention group. Um, so control, and, and we ended up with 70 applications for those 14 spots. Um, we ended up expanding it to 10, 10, 10 and 10. But this curriculum shows now that it makes uh, doctors feel more confident about what they are telling moms. And so this curriculum is available for free, but I have heard uh, that WIC peer counselors have been using it. and. Um, 
people have been using it as a way of um, education ideas for uh, small groups. Uh, there's a lot of, it's not meant, to, this is not a, uh, all, it's not a course. It's meant to be integrated longitudinally into somebody's life experience um, as they're being educated. So there's, it's not one big program. It's little, it's little modules that you can do if you're trying to help a, a small group or a big group learn something about breastfeeding. The American Academy of Pediatrics has a great Facebook page that I happen to moderate. <laughs> um, we, I just posted the magical first hour on our Facebook page, which was a plenary session at the AAP meeting at our national meeting. And a plenary session is one of those that is just um, very, very difficult to get. And we were able to get a plenary session during the national meeting to talk about the importance <coughs> of the skin. It's a 20-minute video. If you needed a really good informational source about why you need skin to skin, it's right there um, at your disposal. Oh. <laughs> I love this picture. This kid's in high school now. Oh. I don't know that she knows I'm still using this picture, but it's still okay with her mother. So. She had twin sisters, obviously, um, and she was um, positioning the cabbage patch shells to get breast milk. Um, and that's important because there are little things in breast milk called microRNA um, that, are, uh, uh, that modulate DNA in an epigenetics phenomenon um, that is passed from mother to child to mother to child to mother to child. And um, so we think that some of what we're seeing um, in terms of diseases in, in uh, populations now that are older might be because we have had three generations who have been formula fed and their microRNA isn't working out well. Their epigenetics is messed up. That's a whole different picture. <laughs> It is scary, but it's an opportunity. I love the fact that we have such an opportunity. And I'll tell you, if you think about this like, okay, let's go back 15 years. Anybody old enough from here to go back 15 years? If I said um, that your babies were going to be rooming in 15 years ago, how many of that would have been true? Right? 10 years ago, were we rooming in? Maybe. Last couple of years? Yeah, right? How many, when did skin to skin start happening? Like when did people start getting interested in the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative? This is exciting. This is such an exciting time to be a breastfeeding advocate because we have all sorts of momentum. And once you get the Joint Commission involved, it's awesome. <laughs> we, have, we have a lot more tools in our in our toolbox than we've ever had before. And I see exciting things coming in the future. And the slides at the beginning of what all the stuff that you're doing in Illinois, we got lots of good things happening. And I, the fact that you even have a state breastfeeding coordinator is pretty amazing. So. All right, did anybody learn anything that wasn't like, did you really learn something immediately? Did anybody not learn anything of something? You know, I get a chance. You gotta give me a chance. I get. I, I can. I can talk. No. You get another chance. I'll get chance later. Okay. Thanks, you guys. For um, we're gonna take a little break. Get a chance for you to uh, move around. Uh, there's some more refreshments in the back of the room. We're going to reconvene here in 10 minutes, and by that clock back there, it says 10.29, so we'll be back here at 21 minutes, but in about 10 minutes, and then we'll have our panel presentation and move forward. Thank you.